Rest in peace, Myra Craft. Patriot, this must be you. Welcome to Patriot Central Radio with Jeremy Dawson and Steve Ball Steve Balistreri. New England, what up? International show report. And welcome back to Patriot Central Radio. Patriot Central Radio is a proud part of the Pro Football Central Radio Network. Tonight, I'm your host, Steve Dallastrari, and I'm joined with my co-host, Jeremy Dawson. Jeremy, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. I can smell the regular season coming up, and today is the last day of preseason. Definitely excited for it. How about, what do you say we get into the show? Let's do it, man, because I know... This is the last preseason game, and we don't have to worry anymore. After Saturday, we won't be talking about who's practicing, who's this, who's that. We're, we're going to know what the uh, roster is, and <clears throat> they'll get right into it, and then we'll start talking about the Buffalo Bills. So Definitely. I mean, two days, got going to be another 22 players, got to cut down. It's going to be It's going to be a hectic couple of days in New England. Yeah, there'll be a, there'll be a, a lot of sleepless nights for the next couple of nights for some some folks. You know, while we're on that subject, where they cut down to seventy five players, were any of the cuts up to this point surprising to you? Um, I mean, I, I don't want to say surprising. Maybe uh, Kamar Aiken. That's that's um really the only one that really was any surprise to me. I just. I mean, I wasn't sure that he was going to make the 53, but I, I, I thought that I would have seen him uh, get past the first cut. Who's that? Um, Aiken. Oh, yeah, Kamari. You know, it was funny because at the beginning of training camp, uh, you know, he seemed like he was doing really well. And then it was like right after that first week, uh, he got a little dinged up. And he just kind of started to slide. And he wasn't getting the reps after that. You know, we weren't seeing him with the first team guys after that. And um, I, I wasn't really surprised by that. Um, the the one guy that kind of surprised me a little bit because I thought he was on the men was, uh, and I can never pronounce this guy's name, uh, Zusevich, the offensive tackle. Right, yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce that either. Yeah. <laughs> I can never pronounce name correctly it's like home man but uh exactly <laughs> but uh yeah i thought that uh he was probably he i had him down as making the 53 man roster but um you know he was dinged up earlier in camp and then w we had read that you know he was on the men but then they put him on ir so i was like well you know right. he must have been hurt a lot worse than they were letting on for them to put him on IR this soon. The the other guy that was a little surprising that they cut him this soon was uh, Razai Dowling. I mean, with him, it was never a question of talent. I thought he was always a talented football player. He just couldn't stay on the field. And I was assuming that we would see a lot of him tonight. And then, you know, it would be up to him to play himself onto the roster. The only thing I can think of was he wasn't well enough to play. And they just decided to cut their ties with them. Right. And it, it wasn't a limit thing either because I understand. I'm pretty sure we, we reached 75 before we let him go, right? Yeah, exactly. They yeah. let him go and then signed another player. Right. And then, um, I mean, uh, it was w when right before training camp started, I would have told you that uh, Ross, I would have definitely, Ross, I would have made the 53 easily. But especially with the, um, problems we were having at corner with um the the injuries and uh Dennard's uh problems with the court but I mean he just didn't show up so you know you got to cut ties you can only keep a uh damaged goods for so long yeah and that's the that's the sad part about it was well, like I said it, it was never about talent with him he just couldn't stay healthy enough to stay on the field I mean this was a guy when they drafted him you know, he started his first two games of his NFL career, and, and he actually played well. I was at yeah. his second game uh, against San Diego, and until he got hurt during that game, that was when he hurt his hip. 
Um, I thought he, he was going to be a really good cornerback, and he had the size that they were looking for. I mean, you know, he's a corner at 6'1", 215, you know, 220, somewhere in that, that, that realm. And uh, he had that size. He had decent speed. I mean, everything they were looking for, he had the talent. He just couldn't stay on the field. Ooh. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, we had second round pick. And then, I mean, when I first started talking about the cut on Facebook and Twitter, I mean, it seemed like a lot of fans were upset and not upset with the fact that he was cut like it was the wrong move. But just like you said, the talent was there and people were expecting a lot out of him. Because, I mean, he's still young. Like, I, I even had a couple people saying, like, watch with our luck. Someone else is going to pick him up and he's going to be a star for their team. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just I don't sense that happening. He's Man. been hurt for so long. I just, you know, it goes all the way back to high school for him. You know, his <laughs> senior year in high school, he was dinged up. And then all through college, you know, he couldn't stay on the field. And then, you know, with the Patriots, this is his third season. You know, yeah. I just don't see that happening for him. I think I agree. Just... I wish him the best, though, but you never know. Yeah. Now, um, there, there are some interesting decisions to be made. Um, who do you see? If do you see them Patriots keeping three quarterbacks, or do you see them <laughs> two? I do. I'm I'm standing by the theory that teams are trying to defend the read option coaches are trying to learn how to defend the read option in order to learn how to defend the read option in practice you need a read option quarterback tim tebow can play that will tim tebow see the field while tom brady is our quarterback of course not but like i said i I just think it's a good and we play the carolina panthers this year that he would be a great quarterback to have during our practices i think i I think he makes the team and tonight's going to tell you a lot actually as to whether he makes the team or not because i understand they plan on playing him for a good amount of time a lot of people say that the only reason he even made it into the top 75, made it past that first cut, was because we need a quarterback for this last preseason game. In case anything happens to Ryan Mallett, Tom Brady doesn't have to go out there. So, I mean, we'll see. I know. And, you know, to be honest, I had him all along making the 53, but I don't know uh, because they, they have some injuries, they have some holes that need to be filled. And I, I just have the feeling that, you know, he's a luxury they can't afford right now. If, you know, if Armstead was here, you know, uh, if uh, Dennard's situation was, you know, uh, more stable than it is, uh, I would say, yeah, I think he's going to be here. But, you know, they, they have some holes. Uh, and then, we're, you know, of course, with Gronkowski not being able to be on the field at the beginning of the year, they, they need to fill some holes. And, I, I, you know, right now I'm not seeing Tebow. On the 53 man now, you know, <clears throat> nobody knows. The only ones that know are Belichick and Nick Casario, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But I'm I'm saying that they're going to let him go, and you know, there's nothing to stop them from bringing him back down the road because I just don't see there being, a, you know, a, a lot of suitors. You yeah. know, you know, cry for oh, we need to sign Tebow. I I yeah. think if Patriots were to dump him. I don't think anyone else is going to pick him up. So if they want to make a long-term project out of him, once you know the the uh, roster is stabilized, there's no reason they can't bring him back. Definitely. I mean, we were really the only team that reached out to Tebow, and I, I mean, before we signed him, people were making jokes saying that he was going to go coach like lingerie football or something. <laughs> Sorry about the net. Yeah, I hear you there. You know, there's a couple other guys that uh, there's a lot of talk about, and one of them being <clears throat> Leon Washington, and he hasn't had a, a, a great summer because, they, you know, they haven't done a very good job of blocking from him. Belichick said that. I was at his press conference last week when somebody asked him those exact, you know, where uh, are they disappointed with Washington and how he's done? And Belichick made it very clear that they haven't done a very good job of blocking for him. And on the special teams, I really don't see them cutting this guy loose. I think he still has a lot to offer. I think the special teams need to step up. Uh, I'm in, I'm definitely in the same boat with you. I mean, Leon Washington was a great kick returner just last year. So 
it's not like this is a guy who's maybe lost a step. Like, this isn't Tim Tebow we're talking about who still needs to prove himself. He's already a proven kick returner. If we're not blocking for a kick returner, the kick returner can't return a kick. That's just that, that's how football works. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm definitely not giving up on Leon Washington. I think that he could be a very valuable piece for us because field position is really everything for an offense. Absolutely. And the other guy is uh, <clears throat> Adrian Wilson. I've been hearing a lot of talk about Adrian Wilson going to get the action. Again, we don't know. It'll be up to Belichick and Nick Casario. But, you know, I see him fulfilling a role that they, they just don't have that guy. And it's somebody they've been looking for for quite a while. I mean, does he have the range he used to have uh, when he was in Arizona? No, he doesn't. You know, he can't cover the guys deep down the field anymore. But, you know, when the Patriots go to that dime package, he plays that money position where he, you know, replaces a linebacker in the box. And that's a position that's tailor-made for him because he, he's a huge safety. I mean, he looks like more like a linebacker than he is a safety. And I, I see them keeping him on. I, I see them holding on to him, and I see him fulfilling it at a minimum, that role. And we'll see what happens down the road. I just don't see them cutting him. Right. Adrian Wilson, another thing, a reason why a lot of people have been saying this in my eyes is because of the play of our other safeties. I think people weren't expecting for, you know, Theron Harmon, Gregory, people weren't expecting for these guys to play well, and they have. So people are saying maybe they don't need Wilson after all. That wasn't a good pickup, but people need to understand we didn't pick Wilson up to play a conventional safety role. We picked him up because he brought something to our defense that we haven't had. That's that physicality, like you mentioned. We don't have, we haven't had a safety that could come play up with the linebackers and make a tackle just like they can. And now with him, that he brings that game to us. And I agree. I think he's another guy that makes it. And then, of course, then there's the running backs, and there's, uh, you know, I think. Ridley and Vereen are about as locked as you can possibly get. But then after that, you know, there's Washington, who we just mentioned. There's uh, um, Garrett. LeGarrette Blunt yeah. and Brandon Bolden. And, you know, that is where it's going to get interesting because I just have a feeling now, you know, after watching last week, they were using James Devlin at, at fullback a lot. Yeah. And I'm wondering now if Devlin – you know, they have him on special teams, and that, that's always a big indicator with Bill Belichick. If you're playing special teams with the first guys, that usually means they're going to keep you. And uh, Devlin, you know, he may just make this roster, and Bolden or, or Blunt may find themselves out on the street. Right, and, I mean, that's a lot of people have been asking me, you know, uh, is who's going to make the team between LeGarrette Blunt and Brandon Bolden? And quite frankly, I mean, I'm – I'm not 100% sure that either one is going to make it. I mean, like you said, James Devlin's been filling in, and, I mean, Leon Washington can come in for those, you know, woodhead snaps if Shane Vereen's not up to it. And, I mean, there's really no need for the, so much depth at running back, especially considering all the other positions that we might need. And if we were to save a spot for guys like Adrian Wilson, guys like Tim Tebow, we're going to have depth at those positions. We can't have depth at every position. And that's one thing about this Patriots team. We're going to let go of guys who people are going to disagree with letting go, but we just got to accept it. And I mean, people are still holding on to that first preseason game with LeGarrette Blunt, but he hasn't really done much since then. No. And, uh, you know, again, he didn't play a, a whole heck of a lot. And the offensive line didn't do a good job for anyone last week trying to open up holes. Yeah, last week and, was uh, ugly. Yeah, the the entire game last week was just very ugly. They couldn't hold. They had the ball security was horrible, you know. And it was spread evenly. I mean, uh, three different guys fumbled. Brady threw an interception. You know, the offensive line wasn't blocking very well for him, and uh, it was just a very ugly performance. I thought the first line defense played very, very well, but the second team defense was just gashed horribly. Uh, did you see the same thing? Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't even <laughs> like. There, there wasn't a lot of good to take away from that game. Like, and a lot of people, I always say, do not worry about a score of a preseason game. You, like, scores do not matter. I'm not saying that preseason doesn't matter. Just scores don't matter. It's each individual play you need to watch. 
and it just didn't look good, no matter how you watched it. No, it I was. Mean, not- <laughs> I seen. I, I watched Bolden actually. He had a nice run, and then I I believe he fumbled. Yep. Eventually, after that, and it was just like it. Everything was just up and down, and it just the end of the drive is all just always down. Exactly, and then you know that first drive, Brady moved them down the field really well. Right. I mean, they were. Uh, uh, I believe that Sudfeld fumbled like on the uh, Lions' ten-yard line, yeah. so Brady had moved them down the field, and then right after that fumble, it seemed like the wheels just came off the offense, and everything went to hell in a handbasket. But you know, that's happened the last four years of what everyone likes to call the dress rehearsal for the regular season. The Patriots have basically got their butts handed to them, and. Uh, you know, that's four years straight where a lot of people would be panicking. But, you know, in the last three years, they're 39 and nine. So I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to worry too much about it. We'll see how they play on opening day in Buffalo. Even tonight, they're saying that Mallet's going to start and George Wynn is going to be the starting running back tonight. Wow. So you know, he's going to get a chance to show what he's got. I, I see him as a practice squad candidate only, though. Yeah. Um, how about you move to tight end? Uh, what tight ends do you see making the roster? That's another good one uh, because, you know, it's all going to depend on whether or not that uh, Gronkowski is given, you know, the, the pup list or he's going to stay on the active roster. If he stays on the active roster, I believe that either Fels or Hooman is going to go away. And right now, with Fels being kind of banged up, I see them holding on to Gronkowski on the active roster, uh, Hooman, Sudfeld, and um, who am I leaving out? I'm leaving out. Ballard. Ballard, Jake Ballard. Yeah, Ballard has, you know, he played 41 snaps last week, and he, uh, I thought he he played really well as a blocker. I mean, he he hasn't been a factor in the uh, passing game. Passing game, but. You know, he's a guy that I think that they can uh, definitely utilize blocking. And hopefully Sudfeld will step up enough for, uh, you know, the uh, the passing game to uh, take effect here and be effective until uh, Gronkowski comes back. Right. And I definitely think that um, Sudfeld was um, – he <laughs> – I think that Sudfeld – Definitely separated himself from the other tight ends. And um, I liked Hoon Man a lot in the beginning. But um, he's, like you said, he's kind of neck and neck with Fells. Fells, Hoon Man had it turned on in the beginning. Then Fells kind of stepped ahead of him. Now now Hoon Man's kind of gotten himself back yeah. into that place where he could be back on the roster. Ballard, there are a few people saying that Ballard wouldn't make the roster when training camp, when um, preseason was starting. But like you said, last week he did... He played a good amount of snaps, so I think that they're looking to keep him with the team. It's a uh, it's a tough position. Yeah, it is because you know he's a guy that he is a very good blocker and he's a big guy. And you know it it seems like his I, when training camp first started, we we both seen it when we were down there. He was hobbling in between plays. I mean, he was limping noticeably, yeah. and now he seems to be getting better. And I'm just wondering if, if he'll be able to, uh, you know, come all the way back and actually become, you know, a, a part of the passing game. Interesting. And um, now we're going to go to our first break, and when we come back, we'll get to our first guest. Yeah, I figured I'd just throw that in there because we have that fill-in to put in, and now we can start talking about the Giants game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to Patriots Central. Very good. Yeah, that's impressive. Patriot Central is a proud part of the Pro Football Central Network. And uh, we're going to start talking about the Giants game tonight. The Yes, indeed. I can't, I can't the Patriots are, are in Foxborough taking on the Giants in the fourth and final preseason game. Prior to the games, beginning for real next Sunday in Buffalo. So, Jeremy, you know, uh, the the. Five things I'm looking for tonight begins Tom Brady. And I, I'm wondering if he's going to play. Uh, I've heard that he wasn't. I heard he was on the field in full uniform. Do you think we'll see him at all tonight? I do. And first of all, I just want to say it is impressive that you can move forward with sound effects. 
but um, <laughs> I do. I <laughs> so I can't do it. I'm like a 12 year old. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but uh, Tom Brady definitely. It's, he kept talking like he wanted to get out there. So I don't think the team's gonna tell him no. I mean, we'll probably see him for a drive as usual, and. <laughs> It'll come out for Mallet. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's highbrow radio we're doing here. Highbrow radio. Anyway, yeah, I just, uh, I, I don't think he's going to play. I, I, I really don't. And I hope he doesn't because I don't see any sense in, you know, risking Brady's uh, health right now, um, you know, for a, a meaningless preseason game. But, uh, you know, we've seen stranger things happen. I mean, that is a good point. It's uh, it's not really a need to have him out there. I mean, I think just for Tom Brady's own, like, competitive head, I think he's going to um, get in there. So, But, I mean, we'll see. Yeah, the other thing I'm looking for, and it doesn't matter who's in the game, you know, whether it's the starters, the backups, the third string guys, I really want to see ball security improve this week because, you know, that was something we already touched on. I mean, uh, you know, Bolden fumbled, Marine fumbled, Sudfeld fumbled, you know, Brady threw a pick uh, that was probably a pass he shouldn't have thrown. You know, it they need to be a lot more careful with the ball, especially going forward. Next week, the games count for real. And the, those are the kind of things that will get you in trouble when you go on the road. You know, we've seen this in Buffalo a couple of years ago when they went up there early in the season. They turned the ball over four or five times, and they ended up losing a close game up there. The, these are the kind of things they can't afford. I agree. And on the other side of the coin, I mean, I want to see it from our defense as well. I want to see us making those plays. I don't, I don't like it's all like I mean, the defense didn't play too bad last week. I mean, they. They didn't play well, but they weren't making the critical mistakes, but they weren't making the plays that were being made against us. And we, we're going to need those this year in order for our offense to continue to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's one of the things that the uh, the Patriots defense has always prided themselves on is making the other team make that critical mistake and getting the turnover and, you know, you know putting the offense in, in good field position. Uh, we saw a little bit of that against Tampa Bay. I, I want to see a lot more of that, uh, at least starting next week. I don't know if we'll see much of it this week. I think they're going to play a pretty vanilla scheme against the Giants. And, you know, we may very well see the Giants starters come out. I know uh, Tom Coughlin had said that he wanted to see them go into the last preseason game kind of on an up, uh, upswing and he wasn't happy with the way they played last week, so we may see that. Right, and um, I'm definitely interested to see this game. It's, uh, it's going to be good, especially considering we got to cut half the guys that are going to play. So, yeah, um, it's, yeah 22 it's, guys going to be out of work next week. So This is it. You know, it's the fi- final chapter. That's it. Well, what do you say we take a break and we'll bring on our next guest? Sounds good. Fans, check out ProFootballCentral.com for all the latest NFL news and analysis. Also, check out the very popular Pro Football Central radio network for awesome NFL talk <coughs> around the league. Go to ProFootballCentral.com. ProFootballCentral.com. This is Michael Jonathan. This is David Nelson. This is Rob McClain. This is Antonio Brown. Hi, this is Kyle Rudolph. On the Pro Football Central radio network. We're here. And welcome back to Patriot Central. Um, if you just heard that spot, you didn't hear Zoltan Mesko. That's what I was waiting for. But, hey, we're going to do uh, an interview now with a very interesting guest. We got Fred Scott coming in. He's a freelance photographer, owner of Action Sports Photos. He's also a contributor to Pro Football Central and PFC Draft Radio. He lives in central Ohio. And, uh, Fred, welcome to Patriot Central. How are you? Well, good, guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, we, we appreciate you having, uh, you, you know, you coming on with us and to talk a little football. I want to talk about your article that you just wrote, the AFC Survival of the Fittest for PFC this week. 
Uh, yeah. Share with our listeners a little bit about that. Well, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, the landscape of the AFC East two weeks ago, I remember <laughs> looking on Twitter and seeing Brady possibly having a tweak to the knee in what transpired for about an hour and a half on Twitter. It was just you know, everybody was having uh, memories of 2008 again. And you had to think Buffalo, Miami, and the Jets were thinking to themselves, the window might be opening. And, you know, a few hours later, we realized that, you know, it was much due about nothing. And, you know, he was okay. And then you look at it two weeks later, and the problems that Buffalo and the Jets are having, a quarterback, and then Miami with the devastating injury to Dustin Keller, who is going to be the safety valve for Tannehill, you know, all three of those teams are now facing very adverse situations that's going to really, it's going to hamper their opportunity to try to climb back in this. They see New England with all these young kids that Brady's going to throw to, but they look like they're ready to step up and make contributions, and New England looks like they're still going to roll. Absolutely. And, you know, I was there that day. and Actually, that happened right in front of me uh, when Brady went down. And I, I'm here to tell you, the place got really silent when that happened. And people, you could hear, you could hear audible, you could hear audible sucking in of breath around the uh, the practice facility that day. And there was a lot of people there. And uh, to see him down on the ground grabbing his his knee like he did in 2008, it wasn't, it it was not a good feeling because you, you know we were. We were seeing that, and it was like, oh, man, here we go again. Well, you know, what's interesting about that, and, you know, the NFL is such a bottom-line business, and when you really look at it and you, you, you take away all of the fluff, you really have maybe eight teams that have a realistic chance of holding that trophy at the end, and – of those eight teams, the majority are dominated by great signal callers. And when you have that guy go down, it's over. Your season's done. Even in 2008 when the Patriots were coming off that 16-0 and season, they went 11-5, and but what a lot of people don't talk about is they went 1-5 and against playoff teams. They couldn't beat anybody that was good in that season. So they went 11-5. and They didn't make the playoffs which is only the second time since 1978 that happened. The team winning 11 games, not making the postseason. But the truth of the matter was they didn't deserve it because they couldn't beat anybody that was good. No, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, and as well as Castle played, he did struggle against the better teams. Uh, yeah, he Jeremy, did. I'm going to pass it over to you. Um, I was going to switch topics a little bit, get over to uh, stay on the injury side of things with uh, Rob Gronkowski's injury. I was wondering, obviously, Rob Gronk, Gronkowski is a key part to the Patriots offense and um sure. I was wondering if the Patriots thought the first few weeks like firing on all cylinders do you think that we keep Gronk out a little bit longer just as kind of a precaution or do we want to get him back out there and with the team as soon as possible you know I think with Gronk everybody knows that with Belichick everything's mapped out three months in advance he knew exactly the time he wants to put him back in there when he wants him to be ready. And I think that what you're going to find is we open with Buffalo and Buffalo next week, four days later the Jets, and then Tampa Bay comes back to New England. And I'm sure in that room when they talk about it, they believe that with the talent they have without Gronk, they can take care of business in the first three weeks. Then they make the trip to Atlanta, and that's when they're going to need him. You have Atlanta, Cincinnati, and New Orleans. They're going to need him for those three games. And if they put him on the pop, they wouldn't get him till after New Orleans. And what happens if they win the first three and lose the next three? That's not really what they're looking to do, especially if they're trying to get a one or two seed in the AFC. In the end, that's what you're looking for. You want to get the bye. You want to play the second week at home. And you're going to need Gronk for probably – you're going to need him for those last 13 games. Yeah, definitely. That, that's definitely a good point. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't want to disregard the Bills and the Jets, but I mean, it is. It's not like those games are going to be very telling. 
And you know, uh, take sorry, a look at ahead. last year. They they go into Buffalo. They're trailing twenty-one to three at the half. They wind up winning that game fifty-two <laughs> to twenty-four or twenty-eight. So I, I think that even without Gronk, they're going to put up points. And if Jeff Tool is the quarterback, he's going to make mistakes. Right. Kid hasn't played the game. So even without Gronk, I'll have Sudfeld. Tompkins is playing well. And don't forget, Amendola didn't play in week three against Detroit. And for whatever reason, New England goes and plays a preseason game up in Detroit. The Lions play it like it's an NFC championship game. And New England plays it like they're, you know, trying to play some flag football. And for whatever reason, we look terrible doing it. And then people start to get worried. And the same thing happened a couple of seasons ago. And uh, last time I checked, I think we went to the Super Bowl the last time we went to Detroit and lost yeah. in the third game of the preseason. <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, uh, talking about Gronkowski, th- didn't you think that that was a little bit of gamesmanship we saw th- early this week? All of a sudden, he's out on the field. He's catching passes with these big, bright white gloves that stick out so everyone knows he's catching the football. And it was just a little bit of gamesmanship. And Belichick was telling the first three people that are on the Patriots schedule, hey, he could come back anytime. And it's just no forcing question. him to say, uh oh, no this is something else we have to consider. Well, yeah, I mean, once again, it comes back to the point I made earlier when I said that everything's calculated with Belichick. He knew what he was doing. He put him out there with the Mickey Mouse gloves on. Everybody saw it. He's out there catching passes, running routes, doing agility drills, you know, with the big sign that says, hey, look at me. (laughs) It's well calculated. I don't think Belichick does anything that's not well calculated. Yeah. Uh, You know, that's that's a good point because uh, everything is calculated with the Patriots and everything's done for a reason. And if anyone doubts that, then you really don't follow this team very well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, just look at it over the course of the 14 years. I mean, everything he does, is it, it, there's a lot of rhyme and reason behind it. And like tonight, for the game tonight, you know, Brady's not going to play. Now it's probably going to play a quarter. Tebow's probably going to play three quarters. And the funny thing is you, you'll read articles, people will say, oh, this is he's playing for a roster spot. When they signed him in the summer, they didn't sign him in the summer so they could cut him at the end of August. I think what you're going to find with Tebow, his value, as far as I'm concerned, his value in that coaching staff room, they look at it and say, well, how can he help us get ready for whoever it is? Let's say when they play Carolina, and Carolina is going to run that pistol offense. He's going to be valuable that week because he's going to play the running quarterback. So every time they have to play a team that's going to have that twist to their passing attack or their running attack, he's going to be the guy. Because in years past, it was Troy Brown or Julian Edelman or whoever the converted quarterback that now plays wide receiver or cornerback. That's the guy they had play that quarterback position in practice when they were getting ready for the running quarterback. Now they don't have to do that. They have a guy that can do it because he is a quarterback. Granted, not a very good one throwing the ball, but he's going to give them what they need, to see, the looks they need to see in practice in order to be ready for those games, especially Carolina. That's where he is going to give them the best value. We are in the same boat. <laughs> I brought that. Yeah. I brought that one up earlier. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that Tebow is definitely going to. I, I think that he's going to make the team for the same exact reason. I think that he's going to play very well against. Um, during practice playing that role. And I know that coaches want to find out, well, not find out, but figure out just how to stop this read option and pistol offenses. So there's no way, better way to do it than to practice against it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's where his value comes in. And I know a lot of people think, well, you can't really tie up a roster spot with a player like that. You know, the Patriots have run with two quarterbacks for so many years now, but you know, you need the value in a guy that can help you prepare for teams that are going to give you looks that you don't necessarily see every week. And with the way the evolution of, you know, that read option game 
his coming to the NFL is it's going to be really important. Right. So um, so just looking across the uh, Patriots Ross, uh, the Patriots schedule. Um, what would you say is maybe their uh, say three biggest games of the year this year? Oh well, well, you know, earlier we talked about Gronk. You know, when you take a look at that stretch at Atlanta, at Cincinnati, home for New Orleans. You know, that's the big stretch early. And then you're going to have Denver later, and then you've got split out from Denver will be the road games in Houston and in Baltimore. You know, that's really the six games that if they go four and two, they're going to be sitting pretty come playoff time looking for a bye. If they go three and three, they're really going to have to do well the other ten games. Interesting. Steve, back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to share something with you. I was looking through your portfolio, I was switching gears here for a second on your uh, photographic studio, and I was looking at pictures from the Denver game last year that you took. Yeah. And I think I was sitting right behind, exact, I was in the second row at the Denver game, and I was looking at some of your pictures, and you must have been right underneath where I was sitting in the second row, because I was like, I thought I took some of those pictures. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. You know, it's funny as it was, uh, I had a chance uh, to come back home and visit some family and uh, go to that game. And I'll tell you, it's actually my, that was my fourth Manning Brady game. I've been to the 38, 34 goal line stand in Indy, the 35, 34, fourth and two, uh, one early in their careers. And then, that one against Denver, and they're such great games. And the one when Brady's kneeling the ball, if you look diagonal to the right, you can see Peyton in the background, and that was the primary reason I put that on there. Yeah, that that was a great shot, and, you know, that was a great game too because, you know, uh, at the time when it happened, I mean, you don't know how many more times that you, you're going to see Peyton Manning come to Foxborough and go against Tom Brady. I mean, both of them – you know, they both have limited shelf lives, and they're closer to the end than they are to the beginning at this point of their career. And I thought it was a great game to go see as a football fan. I don't care if you like either team, dislike either team. You know, as a football fan, as a fan of the NFL, I thought that was a, a, a must-see game last year. I was really glad I was there. And uh, we were lucky enough to sit down right on the field. And, uh, yeah, that's when I uh, when I saw your pictures, I was like – you must have been right down. You were on the field, weren't you? Um, no, I was close. Oh, okay. So you must have been sitting right in the same area we were because it was like uh, I'll, I'll email you some of my pictures because the, the uh, point of view was almost exactly the same, which I thought was really cool. No, yeah, I would, I'd love that, certainly. Um, I, You know, back to your point about Manny and Brady, so many times I had conversations with friends and, you know, my family migrated out to Ohio years ago, but, you know, Boston's always home. And I've been fortunate, like I said, to see four Mandy Brady games. And I tell everybody, if you're a fan of the National Football League, if you have an opportunity to see Mandy Brady, it's, it's, a, it's one of those games where you know no matter what you're going to be entertained and you're going to feel like I got my money's worth on this night because it's two of the greatest quarterbacks ever. And obviously their resumes in January are different, but that's a story for another day. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And, uh, but you know, you have to respect the, the game and that's why I, I was so happy to be there last year because, you know, at the time uh, that was still fairly early in the season and, you know, there was still a lot of questions of whether or not Manning was going to be able to come back and be effective. And that was one of the first games where I thought he showed he could. I thought he had a lot of zip on the ball that day. And up to that point, people were saying that, oh, you know, he doesn't have it anymore. And I thought that changed. I thought he played well down the stretch. But, you know, again, this year when they come back, uh, that's a game that you have to circle. And it's, you know, one of those must-see games. It, always a must-see game, and certainly they put it on prime time. You know, the NFL knows it's a marquee matchup. And when 
Peyton was in Indy, they always put that game on during Sweet Sweet because they knew TV rating wise it was going to be the marquee game for the season, and that's how they always projected it anyway, especially when the schedule came out. But, you know, the interesting thing about the Super Bowl this year being in New York, when you look at Manning and you talked about the zip on his ball, I'm going to be real interested to see whether or not, and, you know, his record in the cold is well documented. It's, uh, I think, my record in the cold is better than his. And if he winds up getting home field advantage or Baltimore gets it or New England gets it, he's going to wind up playing – He's going to wind up playing three games, including the Super Bowl, if they make it, probably in sub-freezing conditions. And I don't think he's won three playoff games in sub-freezing conditions in his 15-year career, let alone three in one season. So everybody that's picked in Denver, I'm, I'm pretty impressed that everybody just kind of looks at that and says that doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, that was the one thing that, you know, against Baltimore – uh, that cold weather definitely seemed to affect him last year. And, uh, it did. you know, he, it did. he did not have the zip on the ball that he did when the weather was a little bit warmer. And that would be definitely something to monitor. I certainly think so. I think it's something to keep an eye on. And I like the dynamic of the cold weather Super Bowl. It's uh, something tells me we're going to see two, two physical teams probably play in New York. Absolutely. Jeremy, you have uh, any more questions for our guest? Yeah, um, I was wondering how you feel. Um, Steve and I were speaking earlier on our uh, running back situation. Um, which running backs do you think are going to end up not making this roster? I'll tell you, that is such a that's a really good question. I mean, they all have they all have different things they bring to the table. I know a lot of people are wavering on whether or not Leon Washington makes the team. Um, you know, his past history being a kick returner was really, really good for the Jets and Seattle. The problem is we've got so many touchbacks now that it seems as if his his greatest asset is diminished because of all the touchbacks. So the question then becomes, if you keep a guy like Tebow, you keep another guy like Leon Washington, who may be a safety valve for Shane Green. I think if Leon Washington makes this team, it's going to be because they think in that room Shane Green will not stay healthy for 16 games. If they're not a believer that Green's going to make it through the season, I think Washington stays because that is the crutch for Vereen. And then Bolden, Blunt, and uh, Ridley, you know, they're, they're all very similar. I like Blount a lot. I think he he brings his his vision in the hole is better than Bolden's because he's been in the league a few years. But I think he anticipates the lane well. Bolden, you know, he'll he's young. He'll run it up in there. Uh, he's fearless. If I had to pick between Bolden and Blount, I think I would go with Blount. Nice. But it's it's such a it, it's. That's a tough call. It really is. It's a tough call. Although I will say this, if the Patriots decide that they're not going to pick up the contract for Ridley and they're not going to pay him the money, they may keep Bolden because they want him to be the replacement for Ridley should they not decide to pay Ridley when the rookie contract runs up. Interesting. I, I mean, I got to agree. If, if you're looking for a situational back, I, I see – Um blunt as that guy but Bolden has that explosion of a uh, as a starting running back so it's it's tough to it's definitely tough to pan out but they got to make a pick Steve any final questions well we're, we're gonna have to uh, break here Fred because we have our next guest on the line and we're gonna have to do a short commercial break but we want to thank you for coming on and you know we hope you'll come back again sometime during the season Absolutely, absolutely. And let's hope for a great oh. season, and I'll talk to you guys later. Right, thanks okay. for coming out. Football fans, check out ProFootballCentral.com for all the latest NFL news and analysis. Also check out the very popular Pro Football Central radio network for awesome NFL talk around the league. Go to ProFootballCentral.com. ProFootballCentral.com.
And welcome back to Patriot Central, everyone. Our first guest for today's show with us, Bob Sosi, the radio play-by-play announcer for the New England Patriots, who was named the new Patriots announcer back in April, joining commenters Scott Zolak on 98.5 The Sports Hub, which is the official flagship radio station for your New England Patriots. For the past 16 years, he has called radio play-by-play for the Navy College football team. Welcome to the show, Bob. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Great to be with you. Definitely. Likewise. Um... So, just going to get right into it. My first question, um, I understand the position you are now taking over was formerly held by one of the newest inductees of the Patriots Hall of Fame, Gil Santos. And I was wondering if you had a relationship with Gil, and if so, uh, what kind of impact might he have had on your career? Well, the first relationship was broadcaster and fan. I was a great admirer of Gil's work. I have a lot of respect for the body of work, and not just with the Patriots, but in New England, the Celtics. Boston College, his morning sports reports on WBC, AM, et cetera, et cetera. Gil was the voice of the Patriots for three and a half decades and earned a rightful place in the Patriots Hall of Fame, as you mentioned. He's a legend in New England, as you know, and someone who, in particular with Gino Capaletti, uh, with their long association, their marriage on radio for so many years for the Pats, uh, became part of the Patriots' uh, organization uh, in the eyes of, I think, just about everybody who follows the team. You know, you associate a team with its players on the field and the ownership, especially in the era uh, of Robert Kraft and his family uh, since they purchased the team in 1994. But I think Gil Santos and Gino Capaletti are right there, too, uh, along with uh, Belichick and Brady and, and Bruschi and the great names in, in, in the history of the New England Patriots. So following him uh, in many respects was intimidating. But one of the things that I think I benefited from was, uh, if not a, a relationship per se, then at least some communication and advice from Gil. Uh, Gil first heard my work from the Naval Academy in 2008, uh, offered a critique of a CD that I sent him, I uh, had some very kind words for the most part, and really gave me a great deal of confidence. And then after I began pursuing this position in 98.5, showed some interest in me, and Gil offered advice periodically. And we also talked after I was hired. And, uh, you know, he's been, uh, as I mentioned, somebody who's really set a great example, uh, just as a fan of his work, listening to him for so long, but also on occasion providing some uh, some uh, great nuggets of advice. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely a great connection to get, considering you're uh, taking over for him now. So, um... I was wondering how difficult it might have been for um, leaving your former broadcasting job to come to the pros. I mean, I figure, of course, this is every broadcaster's dream of making it to the pros, but I'm sure you must have grown a love for Navy football over the last 16 seasons. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Navy is a very special place. Anybody who's ever had any experience around a service academy understands that. I mean, we have all, all have such great reverence for our military, and to think that the young people who attend the service academies uh, are out on the field. They're competing very passionately in their respective sports, but then they're committed to at least five years of service. And in the case of the Naval Academy, five years in the Navy or Marine Corps. And so many of the Navy football players through the years have graduated and then gone off not only to serve the country, but to do it in harm's way. And uh, several, unfortunately, have been lost paying the ultimate sacrifice to the country. And that's a d- dimension that, that makes it uh, almost unique. The only other Division One football playing schools that you know, share w- what Navy experiences our Air Force and our Army. So it is a very, very special place. Uh, the graduates of the academy uh, have such a, a great passion for their institution and to have been their play-by-play broadcaster for 16 years and to represent them and also describe to them you know, what the football team was doing each week was an honor and a privilege for me. So much of the audience listening to games to spread around the world, uh, try to follow Navy football via the Internet. And I heard from a lot of former players through the years who, after they graduated, went off to serve, as mentioned, in the Navy or Marine Corps, but, but stayed in touch with the football program uh, through the words of our radio broadcast. So that was very, very special. But as you mentioned, the NFL represents the pinnacle of, of, of broadcasting and profession and broadcasting football. And uh, we all dream, uh, I think, when we get started in this business of, of reaching the major league, so to speak, and to do it at home. Uh, my two children were born in Boston. My wife is from this area. We have a lot of family here. Uh, to do it at home and 
to do it for such a great organization with, with such a tremendous crop record and such a fabulous fan base across New England and really around the world uh, makes it extra special. I'm a very, very fortunate guy. Definitely, definitely. So, uh, Steve, you want to hop in? Yeah, Bob, uh, I appreciate your comments about the service academies being a 17-year vet with, the, of course, the Army. I, I was the enemy over there at the uh, Naval <laughs> Academy. <laughs> But I appreciate yep. those comments. Um, and, you know, I wanted to ask you a question about the, the academy because uh, there's a strong Belichick connection down there. Did you ever have dealings with Steve Belichick while you're there? And I know Bill visited, uh, you know, from time to time down there. Did you have meetings with Bill prior to taking the Patriots job? Well, well first let me say, too, that, and this is not an exaggeration, my favorite football team in college football is – the Naval Academy's team. My second favorite is Army's. I root for Army every game except for the last game of the regular season when it plays Navy. So I'm a huge fan of the Black Knights and uh, always have been. But I did know Steve Belichick. Uh, Steve coached at the Naval Academy, as you well know, for 33 years, retired in Annapolis, lived there uh, until his final day on Earth. And, and a good part of that day was spent in Avery Marine Corps Memorial Stadium watching Navy against Temple and had the good fortune of talking to him any number of times, listening to stories or, or hearing his comments or thoughts about Navy's football team, about what was taking place in the NFL, or, or occasionally about our radio broadcasts. Uh, it was a great thrill, and you know now we've, we've fucked on it. Uh, I, I wish I had spent more time uh, picking his brain and, and uh, soliciting his insight. He was a revered figure at the Naval Academy. It's a place where a lot of veteran coaches and, and educators and uh, graduates eventually retire to. It's a, it's a special community, and, and Steve definitely held a, a, a very high place uh, when it came to the, the pecking order of, of the revered figures around Navy athletics. I did meet Bill once, uh, but only in a pool of reporters. After Steve's death, Bill came to Annapolis to donate the family's football library to the Naval Academy football offices, and uh, took some questions from several of us, and, and it was a very brief interaction, and of course, I've, I've met him a couple of times uh, since taking this job, and uh, see him regularly at his press conferences down at Foxborough, and uh, like I mentioned, I've, I've talked to him a couple of times since. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, Jeremy, back to you. All right, so... um. Like you said, you've uh, been living in Massachusetts for some time, but I understand that you're originally from New York. That's right? <laughs> Upstate New York. Let's make that clear. Central New York, about five <laughs> hours from New York City. So. <laughs> and, and, I, and I grew up with TV 38 on the cable system. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, a New Yorker by birth and uh, was reared in New York, but I've lived all over the country pursuing my broadcasting dreams. And uh, my wife and I settled in New England in 2008. We moved here from the mid-Atlantic. She was in Baltimore at the time while I was in Annapolis, and uh, this is definitely home. Like I said, it's where our two children were born, and uh, it's where they'll stay. <laughs> All right, definitely. I, I had to ask. I mean, <laughs> that's a fair question. It's a fair question. But, uh, uh, well, well, Bob. Hopefully, uh, if you grew up watching TV Thirty Eight, you have a career as long as my two favorite announcers from there, Ned Martin and uh, and Fred Cusick. So we wish you luck with that. Well, I really appreciate that. I did watch a lot of the Bruins with uh, Fred and, and John, and uh, of course, Ned working with Hawk Harrelson when I yep. uh, followed yeah. the Red Sox for the first time before uh, Monty came on and before Ned gave way to Sean McDonough. But to have tremendous reverence, really, for broadcasting history overall, but especially in New England. Uh, you know, Kurt Gowdy was one of the, the first voices that I recall from my youth, and if, he was, uh, you know, so identified with the Red Sox for so long before he became more of a national voice. But, uh, you know, even before moving here more recently, as I mentioned, I was a fan of Gills. Love the work of Dave O'Brien and, and Joe Castiglione, who's a wonderful guy on the Red Sox games. I uh, have really admired what Don Arcello has done in his career. Uh, Sean McDonough is, is, is one of the stalwarts in the business, uh, a, a guy who's so solid at everything he does. And, and, and an old TV38 alumnus, I remember him uh, periodically hosting Ask the Managers. So, uh, you know, I've uh, a fan of uh, Boston broadcasting, uh, if not all the Boston teams, my really, really, you know, as long as I can remember. Oh, that's great. great. Right, and I um I've seen that you uh broadcasted like quite a few other sports like uh 
basketball and baseball in particular. I was wondering if like one sport is maybe more easier to follow while calling the game than another. Well, I think all the sports really present different challenges. I, I've done mostly football now on the college or pro levels, of course, professional baseball and college basketball. I've done a few others as well, but those, you know, those are the main three that I've spent a lot of time on in my career. Uh, basketball and television, I think the difficulty in, in calling basketball and television is just you really don't have much of an opportunity to set yourself apart from others. It, it, it's, I think, the easiest of the three to call. Um, I've done it on radio, and, and, and you know, I'm a radio broadcaster at heart because you really get to paint the pictures, whereas on television you're only writing the captions, so to speak. Uh, when it comes to basketball and television, which I've done a lot of in recent years, I, I really enjoy it. I love being around college gyms and you know, love the spirit of college rivalries. But I think it's the, the least challenging of the sports that I've done. Baseball is a difficult sport because of the downtime, the inaction, and the, the necessity to, to fill that time, to fill in those blanks with something that's interesting or uh, keeps the, the listener captive. And I love the the nuances of the game and the conversational aspects about it. But uh, nothing more exciting than football. And I think football really is a blend of, uh, of of the best of all the sports because there is action. You get a chance to call on the play-by-play when the ball is in motion and can be creative in doing it. You have those gaps uh, to interact with your partner. You can try to develop a, a chemistry with your broadcast partner, have a little fun, uh, you know, inject a, a sense of humor at, at times. Uh, there's drama. Uh, of course, uh, you know, as a drive, uh, march it deep into the opposing team's territory or as the game wanes on in the final seconds. Uh, there's also, you know, so many different players and personalities that are on the field at any given time and a lot of opportunities during the course of a, a three-hour broadcast or so. Talk about the biographies of those players and maybe interject something interesting uh, about one of them. So I, I really like the, the blend of uh, all the different challenges as a broadcaster that football incorporates. Definitely. That's awesome. I mean, I definitely find it interesting how you mentioned that um, baseball's probably the hardest because I'm, most people would probably, like, who are outside of the broadcasting booth obviously would think that it was the easiest because there's the least amount to talk about. But, in fact, like you said, having mo- less to talk about is harder because you need to keep talking. But, sure, um, I think the great baseball announcers definitely stand out because they have that ability I've never called hockey, and I would imagine that's an extremely difficult sport to call because of the high pace, and especially now because of the tongue-twisting names. I mean, I have great respect for, for Dave Gosher in particular. He's another guy that I think is fantastic and, and really makes uh, surfing the dial in New England, so to speak, uh, a joy. Right, and before we get right back to Steve, um, I was wondering, have you uh, gotten down Michael Hooman's name yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Manal Nui. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, the challenging part is saying that uh, as the ball is uh, being thrown to him or handed to him uh, in, in live action. But uh, we, we, we generally rely on the, the crutch, who man? But, uh, you know, I'm determined to continue to incorporate all those syllables, Omen Alanui, into our play by play. All right, Steve. Speaking of, of the Patriots, I, I know uh, you, you just recently started working with Scott Zolak. I, I wanted to ask you like a two-part question. And the first one, how how are you guys doing together? Do you feel like uh, it's gelling so far? And the second is, how difficult is it doing a preseason game? I, it's difficult enough doing a, you know, a regular season game with all the football players. But, you know, when you have 90 bodies on each side, it has to be really difficult keeping up with what's going on and who's on the field and who's coming off. Yeah, that sure is a challenging part about it. Uh, we had an experience, for example, with Tampa Bay at Gillette a couple of weeks ago where there was a, a last-minute number change, and players do come and go, and, and uh, in, in that case, thankfully picked up on it right before game time, was down on the field and saw the Bucks going through warm-ups and recognized that uh, – there was a different name on the back of a jersey over the number 31 than what was listed on the roster. So we were able to at least get to that uh, and make that correction before game time. And as it turned out, uh, that particular player had a role uh, in uh, in interception late in the game. But uh, it, it's challenging 
broadcast calling a preseason game because, as you mentioned, the number of people. Uh, we all start out with our quote-unquote cheat sheets, our spotter boards to call football. And, you know, it'll be a lot nicer during the regular season when there are only 53 biographies to worry about as opposed, as you mentioned, to nearly twice that number, uh, you know, with the 90 guys that you might see in a given early preseason game. But for me, it was really exciting. I, I can't tell you how fun it's been. Uh, thus far through three preseason games, even uh, the lopsided loss to Detroit uh, at Ford Field, but especially the home opener for me uh, when the Patriots beat Tampa Bay at Gillette. Uh, it was such a perfect, it was really a perfect night. It was a wonderful crowd and uh, a beautiful evening. Uh, so for me, the excitement that night was comparable, I would think, to any regular season game and, and, and maybe on a, on a personal note, uh, any postseason game just because of the significance of calling the first at Gillette. So I think I was so pumped up uh, for for that game in particular and uh, really so excited for all three preseason games that I went into each treating it as if it was a postseason contest. That's awesome. Jeremy, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Right. I was wondering if um, sometimes maybe the emotions of like the game, I'm, I, especially football, considering how like intense it can be during like comebacks or something. Like I was wondering if it's ever like got the best of you while you were working the game and you kind of got more focused on watching rather than um, broadcasting. Well, not got what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet. And, and I hope it never does. Emotion has definitely gotten the best of me in, in, in trying to call some plays. You know, I think the the most exciting calls are generally those that are born out of your honest emotions. Uh, Russ Hodges, the Giants win the pennant when Bobby Thompson won the playoff game against the Dodgers in 1951. Jack Bucks, you know, I don't believe what I just saw with Kurt Gibson in 1988 uh, from a football standpoint. I mean, Gill's calls of Adam Vinatieri's uh, winning field goals in the Super Bowl, but primarily against the Rams. And then, of course, the call uh, when he beat the Panthers as well. Um, any number of great moments in sports, what makes them memorable when you hear the broadcast, the emotion and it is the emotion and the voices of those broadcasters. So for me, there have been times when, you know, I've allowed that emotion to, to nearly spill over. Uh, most exciting in the 16 years at Navy was in 2007 when the midshipmen beat Notre Dame in triple over a time. It was the first win for Navy over Notre Dame since 1963. Um, I, you know, I, sometimes I listen to that call and I think, boy, you sound like a screaming fool. But a lot, to a lot of people who follow Navy football, it, it meant a great deal to them and they enjoyed it. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, emotion was good, and, and uh, you know I'll try to be emotional when it's appropriate. I always believe that uh, if, if you're too excited all the time, then you really diminish your credibility with the listeners. So when the time is right, uh, when Tom Brady leads the Patriots, uh, you know, on a last-minute scoring drive to win a game, and hopefully my emo- emotion uh, will match the moment. Definitely, that's definitely interesting. All right, Steve, you want to wrap things up here? All right, Bob, thank you very much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. We wish you all the best. And uh, we really look forward to listening to your broadcast this year and for many years to come. And we thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you guys. Anytime. And welcome Cigar back fans, to Patriot Central. FifthDownCigar.com and enter the coupon code <laughs> PFC to get 10% off your order. Lots of nice high-end cigars. That's FifthDownCigar.com. Enter the code PFC for 10% off your order. And welcome back to Patriot Central. We now have our next guest on. We have a very special guest at that, Pete Shepard. Pete used to be heard on WEEI in Boston before moving over to NBC Sports Radio 1510. He's also been a regular on Patriots.com. He's a uh, native of Rhode Island, and uh, we're very glad to have him. Pete, thanks for coming on Patriot Central. How are you this evening? Fantastic. It's Ryan Mallett. Just missed Leon Washington wide open, about a 20-yard uh, bomb, and threw it about 15 yards over his head. But other than that, I'm great. <laughs> yeah. I just saw that on Twitter while the commercial was playing. And, uh, yeah, well, it's nice to know that Ryan Mallett is consistent as ever. <laughs> Yeah, he has, he has flashes, but yeah, that's been the problem consistent. But he's still more consistent than Tim Tebow. 
Oh, yeah, well, I'll give you that. You know, it's weird because uh, I was down at training camp, you know, every day this year. And, uh, you know, at times, Mallet just looks unbelievably good. And then the very next pass he'll throw, he throws it in the dirt or he'll sail it. I mean, you know, at the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, he's in his third season now. You, you would think he is, should be more consistent than he is right now. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, uh, you know, you don't know actually what would happen if you got into an actual real game play and had to take over. Nobody knew what Matt Castle was all about until he went 11-5 and five and it wasn't for Brett Favre's stupidity against Miami in the final week that wouldn't make the playoffs. But so, I mean, Mal, I mean, if you look at what Castle did, it was, you know, he really, really blossomed, especially the last uh, five or six weeks of the season. Uh, he was really coming on strong. So, I, I don't know. I mean, Mal's got all the tools you think. He certainly has the arm strength, but there's, there's a lot of Jeff George and Mallet. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think you, you hit it right on the head there, Pete. Um, looking at this team, you know, we've been discussing the, the running back situation, you know, between ourselves here earlier on the show. And, you know, how do you see this running back, uh, you know, slate working itself out here when they do the cut down? Well, I think people, you know, I'm still, I, mean, I think most people are debating about Legarra Blount and, uh, and Bolden, and I, I don't know. I mean, you can make cases for both. Bolden does more in special teams. You know, we saw flashes last year, what he can do at times. And it's, he took over a couple of times last year. He really, really was a feature back. On the other hand, he had a bad fumble last week. We saw what Legarra Blount did against the Eagles and his explosiveness, what he's capable of. I don't know. I can't see both of them make it, making it. And, you know, Leon Washington, which I, I never thought would be a guy on the bubble here, he's certainly on the bubble. And one of the areas I thought the Patriots really needed to improve on this year, there weren't many, but this, this the special teams kickoff returns, they were horrible last year. You know, after McCourty's uh, touchdown, after that, they were terrible. So but it looks like Leon Washington, by all accounts, he's on the bubble as well. So, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. You can make cases for all three. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think jobs are on the line tonight. Absolutely. You know, that was one thing that, you know, when they signed Leon Washington, I thought it was one of those under-the-radar things I thought was going to work out great for them. But the special teams all through the preseason has been – it's been pretty bad all across the board. Not only their, their you know, kickoffs, but their, their coverage has been terrible. And th- this isn't something you're used to seeing with the Patriots. Yeah, well, I mean, I thought he'd take more kickoff return. I think, what is he taking, three out of, out of ten? Or three out of 13, something like that? I had wrote the number down today. I forgot. But, I mean, still, I just, I, I don't get it, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I thought he'd be taking the majority of the kickoffs, so I thought he started off okay. I mean, it's better than anything they had last year. I mean, McCordy ran that one back for a touchdown. And then, remember, the ne- after that, he fumbled. Remember, he fumbled um, the next yeah. time he got the ball. And they were never the same. I mean, I can't remember. But, I mean, you think about how, un- I mean, their offense was already, un- you know, basically unstoppable for the most part. Imagine if they had decent field position to start it. How many times did they start, you know, the 20 or less? They were one of the worst in the league. And they still put up all those points. Absolutely. That's why I was looking forward to Washington coming here. But we'll see how it plays out. Uh, it's still it's still early. I th- I do think they're going to hold on to him. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. Jeremy. Pass hey, it how's it going? Um, hey, Jeremy, so, how you doing? Not bad, not bad at all. Just trying to you know, not watch this game while we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're on commercial break now, so we're good. Yeah, we're good. As you guys were talking, Leon Washington took the punt return and just had to get out of bounds. He looked so frustrated. Yeah. Yeah, but um, question, I wanted to switch it over to tight ends. Um, We spoke a bit on it earlier. I was wondering which tight ends you think don't make this roster. Well, certainly, uh, I remember Zach Sutfield when we were talking in the bottom because I, I watch a lot of college football, and I loved, I love that offense, highly prolific offense. And if he can stay healthy, uh, I thought it was a steal. I think Sutfield makes a team. Uh, and then after that, and it all depends, you know, uh, initially on Gronk and the Pupla situation. That's going to be a big factor. Uh, you can make cases or not cases for Ballard, uh, you know, Ballard, uh, who Manawananui and, and Fels. Um, I have Feeling Fells is going to be the odd man out here, at least initially. Because the two of those guys could be out. Uh, two of those guys could absolutely be out. But I think Sutfield absolutely makes the team. Obviously, Gronk makes the team. And uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Human making the team as well. I think those three make it, and I'm not sure the other two are going to. But uh, you know, Bill may have other ideas. Definitely. Now, 
I'm going to switch gears a bit here. I know we're a Patriots show, but I, I mean, I don't want to have the show go out without talking about the biggest news of the day. So today, as you know, the NFL and the retired players agreed to a six, $765 million concussion settlement. Um, so yep. I just got to ask, what are your thoughts on that situation? Well, you know, it's it's so um, interesting. The whole the whole story is interesting. A lot of people say, you know, it's long overdue. Um, and I brought this up on my show today. First of all, it's a blip, really. If we're talking about money, I know it seems like a lot of paper, but it is a blip compared to what the NFL uh, makes, you know, $10 billion. I mean, it really is. And you start looking at the breakdowns of it. Uh, you know, it's a nice gesture. You wonder how much fraud when it, it you know that was held back in the, initially in the past, um, and how many cover-up situations there were. I think it's you know an abomination that you know ESPN uh, was supposed to run that program, and then Roger Goodell kind of interfered with the concussion program. They were going to run uh, you know I guess with PBS and everything. I, I don't know. It's just there's a lot of shade in this. I mean, I know Roger Goodell now comes off looking like some kind of hero. And I'm glad all these families are finally going to get um, some money. I think the interesting part of it is, though, when you ask all of these players, the ones who are still around and can still speak to the issue, uh, you know, would they change their game if they had to again? And they, every one of them says no. And who was it earlier this week that said, I'd rather get hit in the head than somebody go at my knees? I say, what does that tell you? And so it's the, the hypocrisy is unbelievable. But, you know, that's, it, it's 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 a really interesting story because none of these guys say they ever changed the way they played the game. I want the game to be changed. Yeah, it's definitely it's a difficult situation. I wrote an article actually about how players don't want to be hit in their legs, so the rules that we're making isn't isn't giving the players what they actually want. And then, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of the players wanting to be protected; they just want to be covered afterwards. Is what it all comes down to. Like they, they want to know that if something happens, the NFL is looking out for them. Yeah, I understand that. They also know that's a big risk starting from when you're a kid if you're playing Pop Warner. I mean, you, right. you know, I, I, I you know, I, I played hockey when I was younger and baseball and everything else. I never played organized football. I, 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 my one regret in life, really. But you know, you know, every time you step on that field or step on the court or step on the diamond or step on the football field, I mean, it's a risk. And you start playing at a much higher level, Division One or high school Division One. And pro, I mean, it's there. I mean, think of the contact just on the lines, offense and defensive linemen. Think about it even on a high school level, how much contact is being made every single day, you know, to even two-hour practices at a high school level, uh, you know. Uh, but you know the risk. Parents know the risk when you get involved in this stuff. I know pros know what they're getting into. So, I don't know. There's kind of a fine line there. I mean, I, I agree. There's, I think information was maybe kept from them, and I'm sure there's a lot of fraud and deceit this whole scenario, but, you know, in the end, I still think it's the irony of these guys saying they would not want anything to change. They do everything exactly the same. It's just, it's, it's an interesting part of the story. All right. It's definitely a tough situation, Steve. Yeah, Pete, I, I can definitely uh, sympathize with the players there. I was a special operations guy in the army for 17 years and I ended up getting, you know, put out to pasture because uh, I got all busted up and my family always asked me, if you had to do it all over again, what would you change? And I always tell them the same thing. Not a thing. I walk like Walter Brennan now, but I wouldn't change a thing. And I guess maybe that speaks something about maybe I took a few blows to the head as well. But, uh, <laughs> Pete, we yeah, want to thank you. But you were in the, the service defending our country, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, I think, uh, well, you're the real hero. I mean, thank you for your time. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a little bit different than, um, you know, than playing football. You know, and, and I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, you know, we always talk about, um, we always talk Did about, you know, going to war on the football field, and uh, it's nothing compared to what you went through, I'm sure. Well, it was, uh, like I said, I had a great time, and when you're a young man, you think you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And it's <laughs> when you get older that everything starts to affect you, and now, like, all of the guys have bad knees, bad backs, and, uh, you know, it just comes with the territory. But my family always asks me, what would you change? Would you do anything different? And I always say the same thing. No, I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> but anyway, well, that's Pete, we want to thank you very much for coming. You have an open invitation to join us here at Patriot Central anytime. We always enjoy listening to your show. In fact, I was listening to you this afternoon while I was on the road. Uh, I was going to my chiropractor, speaking of bad backs. <laughs> 
And uh, <laughs> but I, I lost your signal while I was driving over there. But uh, and when you were talking about this very issue, so uh, I wish. Yeah, I well, got... I mean, you can always listen on uh, on TuneIn app. You punch in fifteen ten WUFC, or you can listen. We have a listen live link at the top of the uh, fifteen ten NBC Sports Radio uh, dot com page. So. It's a 50,000 watt signal, but it has, there's some blackout spots. It goes through five states, but yeah, um, you know, we do the best we can, but the way everybody listens on the internet now and tune in app and online, uh, it, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're definitely making it a serious dent. So it's going great. So uh, anytime you guys need me, give me a call. Pleasure being on with you. Hi, this is Steve Nelson and you're listening to Patriot Central Radio. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening to Patriots Central. You can listen to any episode by clicking on the Patriots Central off of the Pro Football Central main page. And you can follow us on Twitter at Patriots Central. Follow me on Twitter at jdawson underscore NFL. And my co-hosts want to close out? You can follow me at SteveB7SFG on Twitter. And thanks again for listening. This has been a presentation of the Pro Football Central Network. For news, blogs, highlights, and more, log on to ProFootballCentral.com.